Welcome back to Thinking Critical. This is Wes, and I hope everyone had a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving Thursday. We celebrated it here in the Philippines. Uh, I celebrated like a Filipino American style Thanksgiving. You know, some, some American food, lots of Filipino food. We celebrated as a family and had a nice time. And I hope everyone else did, including my guest here today, Joe Corallo. So, to Joe, today we're going to be talking about the, the rumor out there that all comic creators are like destitute and broke and living in like roach motels or studio <laughs> apartments and they, they can't afford food. They're like eating bread and butter and ramen. Yeah. And, and whether or not that's exactly the, the truth of the situation. Yeah, yeah, no, this is uh, something that's been uh, going on for a few years now. Uh, I, I've noticed, you know, there, there are segments that are uh, concerned trolling people's careers, and, uh, you know, it's, it's worth talking about. Yeah, it's one of those things, you know, it's always, it's kind of put out there, and you don't see a lot of pushback on it, so I was like, well, maybe that is true. You know, I, I've talked to a couple of comic creators who are like, well, you know, depending on who you're working for, you might not make a lot of money, you know, some of my good friends are, you know, Tim Lim, you know, he's an yeah. audiologist and, and he writes or he draws comics. My good friend, uh, Mark, he, he's got a regular gig and, you know, he writes comics. So it seems like uh, a lot of people probably have full-time vocations and maybe do comics on the side, or maybe it's a part-time comic gig with maybe some marketing work. I know Aaron Sparrow, you know, he, he does some marketing and stuff like that as well as editing and writing. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I do some marketing copywriting on, on the side myself, but, um, y you know, when it comes to this sort of topic, everyone gets so focused on, on comics that you, you kind of lose sight of the fact that this is kind of a deal with basically any form of entertainment. Like, you look at acting, like, how not every actor is, you know, the rock or, you know, Vin Diesel and, and guys like that making the big bucks. Uh, it, you know, same thing with, like, musicians. You know, I, I think a lot of us have known people in bands and, and this and that, and, like, you, you know, a lot of people, you, you do the music on the side, you do the acting on the side in, like, local theater, or, like, you know, most actors, the, the best they're ever going to do is, you know, a small role on a show, recurring extras, uh, commercial gigs, uh, you know, uh, I, I can't imagine a ton of podcasters, or, like the average podcaster is probably not podcasting full time. Uh, it's just like the nature of the, the beast. But when you go into, you know, writing and, and illustrating in comics, those are transferable skills that you can potentially make a full time career out of, you know, illustrating and, and writing it just might not entirely be comics yeah as an illustrator you can go out and storyboard you can create uh, you know fantastic designs there's certainly a lot of design elements you know in all kinds of business and as far as writing you know you, you can go out there and you know do scripts for tv shows or, or script other things or even do novels and stuff like that so you're absolutely right the, the, the skills do tra transfer uh, but i imagine you know you you said you know you you have stuff on the side of and you, you, you're friends with a lot of independent creators. Is it, are they all destitute and poor, or do, do a lot of them just have other vocations? Uh, a lot of them just have, uh, they either have other vocations, or they're in the um, sort of transition phase of moving from full-time work to, um, you know, part-time, and then doing comics and, and entertainment full-time. Uh, I mean, I know creators who, you know, they you know, maybe they're teachers or they uh, work at Starbucks part-time. You know, I know a few who who work like part-time at like Starbucks to like get benefits and, and whatnot, like healthcare benefits. And then mm -hmm. they're doing comics. Uh, I, I know, you know, people who were able to successfully turn crowdfunding into, you know, full-time work by, by putting out books. Uh, you know, uh, on a regular basis. Uh, Pat Shand with, uh, you know, Space Between Entertainment, he, he's doing, uh, you know, Kickstars on a regular basis. They always tend to make between, you know, like 15, 30,000, but he does a bunch of them a year. And between mm -hmm. that and the other writing gigs he gets, you know, he can, he can do that stuff full time. I, I mean, there's a lot of 
uh, people who are able to manage that. And, um, you know, I, I've been to a lot of their places and, and they live in like normal homes <laughs> where there's like, you know, food in the fridge and things are clean. It's not like, you know, like these sort of, uh, it's fun for people to latch on to like the hyperbole and, and, and make jokes, but it's like, no, a lot of these people are just, you know, people living their lives. <laughs> like it's not, it's not like, you know, what, what some people make it out to be. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like entertainment, like you said. There, there's the top of the heap that are able to kind of uh, do it as a full-time vocation. I'm sure Scott Snyder, although I know he does teach teach in college. I'm, I'm sure his his primary income is probably from comic books. Greg Capullo is probably the same way. You think uh, probably even Brian Michael Bennis. Yeah. Donnie Cates. You know the upper crust. Yeah, they they probably can survive full time on on their comic gigs and maybe even royalties. And I'm not sure how the royalties are right now. But you know, the, most other people, you know, if you can only make so much money in comics a year, and it's it's living in squalor and going out and getting another gig, you go get another gig and you, you keep yourself, you, you take care of yourself and your family. Yeah, I, I mean, with like um, with writers, for example, a lot of the um, a lot of the goal is to be writing full time. And even if it's mostly comics, you, you know, you, you you take these jobs, you know, either writing video games, writing novels. Uh, I mean, we've seen people like Charles Soule, uh, Michael Marici, uh, Fred Van Lente, you know, even like Warren Ellis have, have written novels. Um, it, you know, yeah. Fred and Warren Ellis was writing the, the Netflix Castlevania series. Yeah, you, you know, but um, but yeah, like like people like Fred. Fred's a real hustler um, and, and has done multiple novels. Same thing with Michael, um, you know, and, you know, Pat Shand also has written novels, uh, you know, so, so yeah, you, you see that. And then when you see with like artists, I mean, Gabriel Hardman, who just did the, uh, what was it, the Green Lantern Earth One book with uh, Karina Becco, mm -hmm. uh, he's a storyboard artist. He worked on the, uh, a bunch of the Nolan movies, like, um, I think Interstellar, um, he worked on, um, Logan doing the storyboarding. So, like, you, you know, the, these are transferable skills. And we see, and when you get to know certain people, Richard Case, uh, who people, you know, might remember from, you know, Doom Patrol in particular with Grant Morrison, and he had done some Doctor Strange and some other comics, hasn't done comics in a while. It's not because he's destitute and living in a studio apartment waiting for his next gig. He's working in video games. He's got a, a, a wonderful family, and, and he does very well. Yeah, you know, it's just yeah. I think Russell Dowderman, you know, uh, who obviously kind of came to prominence on Thor. He did the War War of the Realms event. He also did some of the Jonathan Hickman giant size X Men comics. I think like his entry into comic books was he was doing some like c character and costume designs for an MCU movie and. He came and went and did some comics. It turned out he liked the he liked the medium. Yeah, no, you, you see that a lot. And, and uh, I mean, part of what people say, where where there is some some truth, is that there are gigs that potentially pay better uh, oh. than than comics. So so that's why it, you know it's tough to get some people to come back. You know, um, if if comics w were paying a, a higher wage, you know, you might see more comics from people like, uh, you know, Richard Case, Bill Sienkiewicz, uh, Alex Ross, y you know, people like that. But when you can get that kind of money just doing, you know, cover work and then doing, you know, character co concepts and, and other kinds of illustrations, it, you know, it's it's hard to get someone in like that, you know, and same thing with, um, you know, once you're, once you transition for, to write, you know, television or something like that, you see someone like Christopher Yost, who was writing a bunch of comics. I, I think he was writing that X-Force run before Rick Remender. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that was Christopher Yost. Uh, you know, he moved into TV and you don't really see him do, you know, comics anymore. Like the days of, Jeff Johns doing long runs on on characters is probably over, you know. And if it's not, you would think something probably happened to him in Hollywood that he's back. Yeah, he's got his own production company where he kind of goes in there and 
I don't think he's no he's like an executive at the Warner Brothers anymore. He's, but he's more like a like he comes in and consults with the characters. Yeah, he's more like um he has his own studio and he would be like a a, a vendor or contractor or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's interesting. Uh, you know, there's, there's always that weird uh, rumor out there. That, you know, when you think about like Image, I know Image has like their own specific deal where you maybe you're not going to be getting a page rate or, or something like that from Image themselves. Like they have a deal worked out where you, you have your comic, you present it to them. If they decide to publish it, like you have to pay them and then they'll publish it. But then you get money afterwards. There's, you know, a lot of people are like, well, you don't really make any money, money with Image. But really, if you hit certain thresholds, like you can make a pretty decent living, living off of Image, right? Yeah, well, it's um, it goes up exponentially because the more you're printing, the cheaper rate you get from the printer to print the copies, so you get a bigger percentage back um, off those comics. So you might make a profit, you know, like you might break even on what you sold after like three thousand units or something like that, and, and you might start making like a decent profit after you sell like. 10,000 or, or 15,000 units, but then once you like start pushing past that into 20, 30, 40, you know, you're getting those breaks from the printer that can really, um, really make it worthwhile. You know, it's, it's a bit, one, one of the problems with, with the image deal is that it's mostly appealing now to people who have a name that can bring in that kind of money. You know, and because it's a bigger it, risk, yeah, it, it's a bigger risk. But but also, they're more likely to have the kind of money to pay, like like a writer or something, for example, is more likely if they're successful to have the money handy. You, you know, I've heard advice going around of like you know, like hey, if you're like a writer at the big two, you know, take you know the money to pay the page rate of, of a big artist that you know their like contract or whatever is either coming up or their gigs coming up at the big two you take them and then you have them draw you know a couple issues or so in advance and you're basically guaranteed to make that you know money money back like like if you like uh, what was it um Something like Paper Girls with like Brian K. Vaughn, you know, and uh, Cliff Chang. It's like, oh, well, as soon as Cliff Chang's ready, I got the money. Cliff, you're hot. He was like mm -hmm. hot off of uh, Wonder Woman, I think, at the time. And, uh, you know, OK, we'll get Cliff. We'll pay him his page rate. He'll, he'll do this book. And, and, you know, it's guaranteed to make money like th those sort of situations. Yeah, we, we got uh, Scott Snyder and Tony Daniel have a new series coming out with Image called Nocturna. Yep. Jeff Johns, who we just talked about, has a new series coming out with Gary Frank. Those two are kind of synonymous with each other at DC Comics. Yeah. And you, you know they're going to sell. Well, they're going to sell, and they don't have to sell as much as, as a big two comic uh, to start making a bigger profit. You're, you're taking more of that money back home with mm -hmm. you. When you're someone like Jeff Johns, you don't need the same marketing apparatus as some guy or, or some girl who, who's doing a, a comic, you know? Uh, so retailers will know to buy it. Image knows it's going to move. So they'll, you know, make sure it's highlighted in previews. And then if it sells a fraction of what, you know, Three Jokers sold, Jeff is still taking home more money. Because it's mm -hmm. a creator owned, you, you and know? he owns the intellectual property for future. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. And and I know that uh, owning the intellectual property is nice, and, and it, it's it's a good thing, and, and creators should be proud of that. It's not like a, a guarantee, like oh, you know, I own the intellectual property to this. This means I'm gonna make a ton of money like that. You know, Hollywood's just waiting to knock down my door and. You know, throw money at me for the you know option rights and all that. Um, you know, the reason Mark Miller is the only one with the Netflix deal yet. Yeah, like like there's <laughs> stuff like that. Like there there's money to be had. Um, you, you know, when you're looking at 
you know, uh, studios uh, throwing some money to have a hold on the option. And, and then, you know, a lot of times it lapses or, you know, it moves forward and it doesn't pan out. Um, most of the time it doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's better than the lottery, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's still, it's still a, a risk. It's still something that happens to a lot fewer people than you'd think. I, I mean, I, I remember a lot of properties that, you know, even big two properties that like it sounded like, oh, that's going to happen. And, and no. Um, oh, yeah. Do you yeah. remember the was it uh, Joss Whedon's Batgirl? We had the Go Gotham City Sirens was in production. And, yeah. you know, you never hear anything about it. Those are they're dead projects. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's uh, it's crazy that anything comes out, despite the fact that there's <laughs> too much stuff to watch. Uh, but, you know, and then image also is broken up into, you know, different like fiefdoms and, uh, you know, like Robert Kirkman's Skybound. Mm -hmm. There they pay a page rate, but they take part of the ownership. But yeah. having part of that ownership, if you're part of Kirkman's sort of network, you know, he then has an incentive to get and he your has, thing made. He has doors open to it. He yeah, he has successful. doors open to him, and he's getting money off it because he has, does have that partial, you know, he's taking some of that. Some uh, skin in the game. Yeah, so so there's more incentive to be like, oh, hey, we, we better make sure this gets made. Um, Dude, yeah. So, so Joe, you, you, I've seen some pretty nasty stuff on social media. I'm sure you've seen it, too, where... Uh, you know, creator will say something, and then he'll come back like, you know, have have free fun being poor and destitute you know, your entire life. Obviously, it's usually much nastier than that. You hardly ever see the the creators really come back from that. It almost some people I think people take it as like just acquiescing or accepting like their kind of lot in life. Do you do you do you think creators should should fight back and be like, listen, I I ain't poor. Do you think it's better to just leave a stupid comment like that alone. I, I tend to think it's, it's better to leave it alone because ultimately then it starts turning into something like, oh, well, now you're boasting about how much, you know, money you're making. No wonder the comics industry is going down. They're throwing all their money at people like that. You, you know, like you can't, mm -hmm. you can't win that, that kind of argument. Um, I, I, I don't think. And, you know, and again, I just go back to it being this, like, concern trolling of someone's, like, career and their wealth. And, you know, different people have different goals. Different people live in different, you know, parts of, you know, the country or the world. Uh, it, you know, making X amount of money in New York is way different than making X amount of money in, like, you know, Michigan or, you know, South Carolina or something like that. Um, like I know people who are full-time creators who have, you know, made major life purchases and, and things like that. Those things happen. Um, uh, you know, a, a lot of people are just sort of, you know, living their lives, trying to get by, uh, you know, I, I think it's more the, the stability, mm -hmm. you know, because when you're, you're contract. Yeah, you know, your 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 contractors. So so that's, you know, that's something that could happen down the road. But I mean, that's it's becoming more and more true in every line of work as we've been seeing through the pandemic and layoffs and you know shutting down small businesses for for certain times. That like nothing's really a guarantee. So so yeah, I, I think it's something people shouldn't be concerning themselves about or, or stressed about. Um, it's concerning when we see things like with Bob Wycheck recently with yeah. glaucoma having his GoFundMe. Uh, Bill Mesner Lobes has had a, a GoFundMe in the past and uh, was at least briefly homeless, despite the fact that he worked on uh, you know some big books, including Wonder Woman, including um, was it um, Max at uh, Image. I'm trying to think. He he was one of the early people at Image and uh, mm -hmm. and, and made made good money, but but things don't always work out. So so yeah, when you see stuff like that, it's it's concerning. But yeah, it, I think there's a isn't there a story like they Bill Finger was discovered like homeless, living like kind of on a bench or something. There, there's stories like that. There was a story. Yeah. I think it was Jerry Siegel. It was Jerry Siegel or Joe Schuster, but I think it was Jerry. 
Or it was Joe. I'm, I'm trying to think. One of them. Maybe I got him back. Maybe, maybe it was the creator of Superman, the, the, the boy that they found kind of in that situation. Well, well, the story was um, the, the guy was a, a courier and was delivering something at the DC office, and, and Jerry Robinson recognized him. Mm. And, you know, DC, like, they, they pulled him in the office and, you know, they, you know, gave him some things and, and tried to, you know, kind of make things right because that's a really bad. Uh, PR move if that breaks into the news of you know uh, Superman creator uh, courier to DC office is not a good look. Yeah. So so yeah so, so you'd have things like that. Obviously there are other you know creator issues and you know creator rights that kind of overlap in, in, into a lot of this stuff. But I mean you also see that in in Hollywood. We you know you've heard different uh, stories of this actor this. You know, director, some things you know fall from grace, and that they lost their fortune. Like, it, yeah, you, you know, see it in professional sports. It yeah, it's not it's not unique to comics. I I think when we all focus a lot on when we get that laser focus on on comics, and, and we see that, and we start going like, gee, there, there's all these problems. Like, like I'm not diminishing the the problems in the industry. But they're not exclusive to comics, and it might mean that things have to change not just within comics but outside comics. So you know, if if I had a perspective creator, you know, that was like, you know, I, I would like to to put my my heart and soul into comics, maybe keep the part time gig, but really start pursuing comics. You you would you would say go for it if that's what your passion is, and you know, there isn't one right answer. If you want to work at the big two. Go and pursue a, a, a path to the big two. If you want to do uh, image comics because they have a, a, a deal that's different than everybody else, go pursue that. Go pursue other independent comics that do have page rates if you're interested in that. Or go do crowdfunding. But, you know, there isn't one right answer. You know, they can no. all work. No, there, there absolutely isn't. And even if you're working a, a full-time job, it was, uh, I think Michael Marichi was, was telling me this, he, you know, he, you know, to make time, uh, to write, it's like, okay, lunch break, I'm writing on my lunch break. I'm writing when I get home. If, if you're in a city and, and you're commuting on a train or, or anything like that, or a bus even, like, write on that. You, you know, like, if you're illustrating, you can do the same sort of things, you know, draw during your lunch break, draw on your commute. You, you, know, uh, uh, you know Drew Zucker? Uh, I, I know Drew Zucker. I don't know him personally, but yeah. He's the artist on Canto. Obviously, yeah, Canto yeah. Two is coming out right now. He's mm -hmm. been on the channel. He's a really nice guy, but he, you know, he's a full time paramedic yeah. during the pandemic, and he's still putting out a comic series. Yeah, I, I mean, that's how he finds finds the time. I'll never know. <laughs> no, it's it's incredible. But a lot of people are like that. I mean, Charles Soule is, uh, you, you know, is a lawyer. He's in a band. Um, <laughs> you, you know, obviously, when you start making more money in one area or the other, you, you kind of shift you know, priorities, but a, a lot of times it's the busiest people that tend to make the time to make things work because that's the only way you're going to get it done. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it's time management's tough. Uh, you got to, you know, work on that because you also need to incorporate downtime or else you burn yourself out. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it, it's hard, but there's multiple paths to get there. Uh, you, you know, but you have to do the work and you have to show people the work. You can't work in a vacuum. You can't be developing things all on your own. You have to share things. You have to get critiques. You have to get critiques you're not going to like. You're going to have to get people that are willing to tell you what's good and what's bad and what you need to work on. And you need to be able to listen and apply it. Yeah. Uh, you know, very interesting stuff. You know, I, I wanted to bring you on here. I was like, you always hear that, you know, that rumor, and we, you and I had talked. You're like, oh, no, no, yeah. you, you'll be fine if you, you know, as long as you can manage your buddy, and, and if you, you're not making enough doing comics, you, you go and do something else. The, the skills transfer, and I just want to kind of address it here on the channel because there is that that um, just that perception out there that you know everybody other than like five guys in comics are just destitute and broke. Yeah, no, that's that's just not. That's not the case, it, it, you know. Uh, that don't quit your day job thinking you're going to make six figures on your first, you know, crowdfunded campaign. But um, you know, that's not, you know, the the case. Mm -hmm. 
All right, well, Joe, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate that. And I, I hope you and your family had a great Thanksgiving. And I, I wish the same for the viewers. Thanks, uh, all of you too. Hope you all had a great Thanksgiving.